I'm Van Hauser, you might know my tools, THC scan, AMAP, Hydra, lots of article, and our famous website. And you have the pleasure to be the second group to be presented the IP version 6 attack protocol suite. Um, but this will not be the only presentation I'm doing. That's why I removed some slides to get it up to speed. Um, because there will be another presentation directly afterwards, which I hope will fit into the time frame. If not, it will take longer. Um, which will be about another project we are now um, starting. This is THC scan next generation. So we don't have much time. I just jumping in directly. So what I will do first, a very fast, very, very fast, three slides, um, introduction on IP version 6. Um, I try to get another hour to do an IP version 6 primer so you understand actually what is IP version 6, how does it work. It looks pretty simple at first, but it's very, very complex. So it will blow your mind just with the three slides. So, um, but CCC said, oh, no time. Our schedule is so full blown, no chance for that. So, but without, they, they said, I should assume everybody knows everything about IP version 6 already if they're in that room. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, then I'll show you a um, quick introduction on the IP version 6 attack suite, which will then show you how to exploit the um, security vulnerabilities in IP version 6. There are protocol inherent vulnerabilities, and this is the first toolkit where you can exploit all of them. Um, well, there is no other tools which exploit them so far, so it's the only one. Um, yeah, then very shortly, what are the known vulnerabilities, so implementation vulnerabilities so far, but only a very small excerpt, and then what is upcoming research from us and what will be the future of IP version 6. So, um, first, why IP version 6? I mean, have you seen IP version 6 somewhere so far? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And if you look on, on our wire here, yes, you will see it. We have, at every time, we have a minimum between 50 and 150 activated IP version 6 devices on our network here. Every Linux box, most BSD boxes out of the box run IP version 6. We'll come to that later because this can be interesting. Um, the second thing is, in some companies it's already deployed. In South Korea and Japan it's very big, so last month I did that presentation, a bit longer, in Tokyo on a security conference because it's really affecting them. They are one of the most, the most numbers of users of IP version 6 in Japan so far. Um, but we will see it in about two years in Germany as well. Not necessarily on the internet, or internet too, but in home area, so on your your kitchen equipment talking with each other, and we see it on the mobile phones. Because T-Mobile and all the others um, have very big problems with the IP space. You have lots of subscribers, and with services like Always On, Push to Talk, and all that stuff, they need to have an IP address all the time. They're using Class A networks, <coughs> the, the 10 Class A network, it doesn't fit. Cross country. So they need a solution for that, and they will move to IP version 6 like Asia already does. So, what is the goals of IP version 6? The most um, impelling one, and everyone will agree, okay, that's why IP version 6 is important, is that there are much more IP addresses. Um, IP version 4 address space is very small, also there's more, much recycling going on now, to not to be forced to move to IP version 6, but if you see that, it means that every one of us can have several million IP addresses just for every person on Earth. That's pretty cool. So that's why IP version 6 was, in the first place, was designed. But just doing more IP in a large IP address space, um, you can do more if you design, define a new protocol. And now IP version 6 gets very, very cool. You have auto configuration of IP addresses and networking. You have in the protocol something like THCP already included like router discovery is all in there. You just plug any device there and it can talk to everyone else and go on the internet and everything. Auto configuration, that's so cool. You just plug in another router. Nothing you have to do for configuration, the device will automatically, oh, there's a new router, cool. To which address does it go to? Oh, great, let's use it. Auto configuration in the protocol, that's very cool. You, have an you can do a hierarchical address structure, which makes um, administrations or network administration much easier. And you have integrated security features, in theory. I'll come back to that later. 
Now the security features are there, they are very good, they are effective, um, but well, we'll come to that later. So this is the IP version 6 header. So if you know how the IP version 4 header looks like, and I had to remove this slide um, because there's not much time, um, you'll see that it looks pretty similar, but some headers are not there. We'll come to that later. So there's, for example, kind of no IP ID um, field anymore. You see there is no option stuff in here. You just see source, destination, payload length, what the next header is, could be TCP, UDP, whatsoever, hop limit, flow label, class, and the version. So like IP version 4, just these fields being larger and some other stuff removed. Why is that? It's a fixed header, and this is what the um, routing guys always wanted to have a fixed header. If you have, like in IP version 4, um, a variable size header, you always have problems with routing packets because you have to know how big is my IP header. And then the O is like this, well, bad. So this, this is why IP version 6 has a fixed header, and everything's are option headers. And this is very nice. So you have extension headers. So you have your IP header. Somewhere later, you might have your TCP UDP stuff like usual, and everything which is optional, like source routing, you have in IP version 4, you have the same also in IP version 6. Um, these are extension headers, and this is pretty cool. So, whatever extension you want to have, you just put in there. So, this is pretty easy. And if a system has not implemented that special option or extension, it doesn't matter, it just jumps over it, and everything still works. So, this is very neat, very clean design. So this is an example of how it could look like. You have the IP header, then the TCP header, and then the application data, or a routing header, or a routing header, then a fragment header and stuff. So that's pretty cool. So that's the basic concept. One more thing about the addressing. Um, your IP address in IP version 6 is based on your MAC address, the host part of your IP address. This is the calculation um, on, if this is your MAC address, this will be your IP address. Yeah. There's a privacy extension which um, makes this random, change this every hour, day, whatever you configure it. So you can have a privacy extension, so it's, your IP address is not reflecting your MAC address. But normally, this is what is done. And it's actually pretty clever because a MAC address is usually unique unless you manually reconfigure it. So there will be no collision in IP addresses. This is a basic example. If this is your hardware address, this will be the host part of your IP address. OK, with this knowledge, we can already start. IP version 6 were first used by hackers, and not by network geeks or whatsoever, for special reasons. Um, first, it, mostly it was used for backdoors. Um, and then enabling IP4 to 6, 6 to 4 stuff, because all the analyzing equipment of the white hats were not able to analyze that. So Lance Spitzner was the first to, to find that on a honeypot where a hacker hacked his Solaris box, um, then enabled 6 to 4, uh, 4 to 6, and, well, hey, Etherreal doesn't show me anything. What can I do? Fuck, what is this guy doing? So this was the first usage, so to hide vectors and to prevent an analysis of the traffic. The other thing is, where's exchange, RC bouncing, and stuff. So hackers were really the first users of IP version 6. Usually the sex industry is first using something, um, but here hackers were first. So um, when we come to hacker tools, what do we have so far? There is not much. And that is what, what I saw as a problem here. So we have some port scanning tools like Nmap, Halfscan 6, there's a patch for strobe, um, but they're not working very well. Um, you can have lots of problems because, what? Why does Nmap doesn't let me scan? Well, there are reasons for that, but that doesn't matter. There are some port bouncers, like really say, 6 tunnel, NT6 tunnels, Azibor, Ninalov service tools, which are mostly connection flooding tools, some packet stuff like LibNet and i66. Um, and what I did, I tried to implement the hacker tools for IP version 6 to attack the protocol, and I tried to use LibNet, it just didn't work. It had not some, had, I needed important features, which it didn't have, 
Um, I tried to implement it in LibNet, and it was a nightmare. So I wrote my own nightmare, at least I can understand. So, <laughs> so, but all the specific IP version 6 stuff, yeah, so attacking the protocol itself, there is nothing. Um, which got me off because I wanted to play around with that. So I had to code my own. Um, usually you have to wait until something is widely deployed to have tools available, well, but I didn't want to wait, and so I'll make this available to you. So it's, it's very easy to use library. Um, you can do numerous of IPv6 exploits in just five to 10 lines of code. Um, lots of the, all the stuff I will present later, all the tools are already included. Um, there is, are some caveats in that. First, it's Linux 2.6 only. Um, whoever, I started coding it on Linux because that's my favorite operating system. One hour later, I thought, let's shoot all the programmers who did that implementation in Linux because it's broken, it's incomplete, and the interface, user space interface, is absolutely fucked up. So it's 2.6 only because I use a proc system, which is, was the easiest to implement fast. Um, it's little Indian, 32 bit, and Ethernet only. So you can play with wireless, and here, um, with a cable, Ethernet, wireless Ethernet works per perfectly, so this will be no problem at all for most people. Yeah. Some like the 2.4 kernel, some like FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Mac, whatever. Well, you're fucked, sorry. <laughs> so it comes with some tools. This is just the, well, I just showed them some of here, but we get into them later anyway. Implementation is very, very simple. These are three lines to generate an ICMP echo request. Um, you see lots of, lots of, lots of options, and you think, ah, can, can't this be easier? Does it have to be so many options? Um, reason is you can, I made it like you can change any single byte in that packet like you want to. So this is why it has so, mo so many options. But beside that, very few lines of code. Okay, so executive summary, and then you can sleep the next half hour. IP version 4 and IP version 6, the impl implemented security is very similar. So also vulnerabilities are very similar because the basic mechanisms are all the same. Um, I will tell about the other stuff later. So in the next half hour, I will show you what are the protocol changes, what is reconnaissance, how you do rec um, reconnaissance in IP version 4, how this will change in IP version 6. This is very important because there will be large changes for us as hackers. Um, local attacks are placed DHCP, how this will be done in IP version 6, smurfing, routing and fragmentation attacks, and finally, coexistence stuff, like we already have here. So, protocol changes. Um, in, there are two things which change, which, uh, which, ha which affects our work as hackers. The first is, there is no IP ID field anymore. This was very nice, as in the usual implementations like Linux, you can see when was that machine last booted, because it's, it starts with zero when you boot the machine, and every second gets incremented by one. So, very easy to see when was that machine last booted. Not highly security critical, okay, but it's interesting. But they removed that, so this is not there anymore. And the other thing is, the, they removed the IP record route options. Who knows about that option? Yeah, it's not very much. How many people know how trace route works? Lots more. This is cooler. <laughs> because trace route can easily be filtered. You can configure on a router, hey, I don't want to send any time to live exceeded messages because it just, just costs me performance. Just throw packet away and be silent about that. Record option is something you can't turn off on routers. So you'll get them anyway. Drawback is you can only have the next nine hops. So you must be near the target you want to trace route to. Ping minus R, that's your trace route alternative. Very cool. And not very people, many people know about that. So the next change is there are no broadcast addresses. And this is bad. Broadcast makes life for us so easy. There, is no, there are no broadcasts anymore in IP version 6. What you have instead are the multicast addresses. Multicast means you can say any node, local, or just the local routers, or you can find all local NTP servers. That's pretty cool. If you want to know what NTP servers have the network, just make a multicast request and you get the reply. That's very cool. But you can only 
ask them from local. So it's not like if you want to know, hey, what are the NDP servers in that city in Japan or that network, it doesn't work. No, only for your local network it works. Well, for some. There are some multicast addresses which are global, but these will be very experimental because this will be very easy for denial of service. Um, so this is currently in the standard experimental and not being used. So as a result, it will, is a big problem to find remote systems. But now we get already to the next stage, which is reconnaissance. Reconnaissance in IP version 4 is easy. A normal subnet size is 2 to the power of 8, so 256 IP addresses. Um, so what you do, you do a ping sweep of the target remote class C network, takes about 5 to 30 seconds, depends on what tool you use, how far away the network is. Um, then you do a port scan to the live host, and then you have vulnerability. You look for vulnerabilities on the active services, exploit them, and well, happy Eastern. Wide range of tools available, NMAP, AMAP, Nessus, lots of exploits, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, when we go to IPv6, this is not possible. The normal, the normal net, subnet size is 2 to the power of 64. It's not, it's not that much more, but a lot more <laughs> IP addresses to scan for. Um, I have no idea how what the name is for that number, but it takes long, I can assure you. So, um, if you brute force and you think, okay, machines get faster, networks get faster, 500 million years until you've scanned the subnet. <laughs> Great. Just that one subnet, which might have just one active server, okay? Um, if you're being clever, like, there will, nobody will use privacy extensions, so we know um, there are special vendors doing, um, doing manufacture their um, uh, the net, Ethernet cards, so only these, the key space is reduced that way, so you can still somehow make this key space much smaller, but still will take some months. And it's still too long to do scanning, right? Who wants to scan for some month until to find out, oh, there are five machines on the network? Yeah, that's not good. So, um, but others have the same problems, namely the administrators of the network. They also have to know which machines are there, so they will have services available for that. So, first, public service will need to be in public DNS. Nobody will remember the IP addresses anymore. I, any one of us who travel around, they know, for example, their primary DNS service they can always put in and be able to serve somewhere. Um, you will not know the IP addresses of IP version 6 DNS servers, right? So, um, public DNS will in the future be the primary source of all information. And inside a company, all hosts will be in the private DNS, in the internal DNS. Otherwise, an administrator will not be able to know which systems are there, um, where they are placed, how to configure them. So, in a result, in the future, DNS will be the primary source of all information, so every hacker will go for the DNS servers because there is no other effective way to find out which systems are there. If you're local on a network, it's easy. But you have to get there first. And to find out what systems are there, you will only have DNS and let's, let's say Google stuff, find out what systems are there, but from the network side, it's DNS. Um, we have some new opportunities like standard multicast stuff to find out about routers, DHCP server, time server and stuff. Um, once you've compromised one system, it's easy to, it's trivial to find all other systems on the same network. That's trivial, but you first have to get there. After that, everything stays the same, so once you know the system, you do the port scanning, you do look which services are there, exploit them, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but remote alive scans on networks will become impossible, and that's the basic point of here, of that here. So, um, I wrote some tool, I wanted to show it, but um, somehow on Linux I couldn't get the presentation to work, so I had to reboot to Windows, so I can't really show the tool. Um, um, I, wrote, I wrote a tool which is Alive 6, which is part of the toolkit, um, which does the following. It sends an ICMP 6 echo request, same like you can do with a ping 6 command. Um, what it also does is sends a packet with an unknown header, a packet with an unknown hop by hop option, and an IP fragment, the first fragment, because then you get an ICMP reply, oh, I can't um, assemble this packet. Um, for that reason, because this you can turn off. 
just configure do not reply to um, multicast or broadcast as ICMP requests. This you can turn off. This you can't. Maybe in the future on some operating systems, but as far as I know for these systems I have reviewed, you can't. So there is always a way to find all local systems, whatever you do. And this is what this tool does. It has some other sets like one-shot fragmentation and routing header options. I'll come to that later because that was research I did and that's pretty interesting. So next topic is DHCP in IP version 4 and what is the corresponding in IP version 6. DHCP, everyone knows, knows it, is used to get an IP address on the network. Anybody can run a DHCP server, so it's, you ha it's all trusted, you have to trust, otherwise you're fucked. Um, you can, if you're a rogue DHCP server, you, you can feed fake DNS servers, routing information, blah, blah, become man in the middle. Um, similar concept in, uh, with ARP, address resolution protocol, which is used to look up a MAC address if you know the IP address, which is important if you want to network connectivity. Anybody can send those replies, so this is a broadcast being sent to anyone, hey, who has that IP address? And everybody who raises his hand, uh, he might be the lucky one to get the traffic. So hackers always try to be first. How does this in IP version 6? There is no security added to both protocols. ICMP version 6 does not have ARP, and you usually do not need normal DHCP. So. First, ICMP version 6 has stateless auto configuration, which means as you have your MAC address, your own, your own MAC address, you always know the host part of, the, of your IP address. You know what, just what you need, it's a network part of your IP address. And routers send around, hey, I'm a router, I, this, is the net, this network should have this IP address range, and if you have five routers, everyone non announcing a different IP address space, but area you will have five IP addresses. Yeah? Different network part, but same host part. This way, you automatically get your IP address. No need for DHCP anymore. Then if, you, if you want to know router, you already see the router advertisement, and you know that. And you know, okay, is this address, this is where it goes to, and what priority of the router it is. Also, there is no ARP anymore. Now it's also done with IP version 6. It was a clutch with ARP. Another protocol beside IP just to solve the IP, how to get the IP address problem, and it's not eff efficient. So what is being done is ICMP6 is now used to get the MAC address for an IP version 6 address. You do a neighbor discovery, um, and a neighbor um, solicitation request and say, oh, who has this MAC address for this IP address? And then anybody can answer and say, hey, it's that. Um, what they also implemented here is a duplicate address detection. So whenever you get a new IP address, you make a request, does anybody have this IP address already? And if nobody answers, okay, I can use it. So how does this work with the stateless auto configuration? Um, if a client needs that message, he can just request it with the router solicitation request and ask for a router advertisement. This FF002, this is the multicast address, all local routers. So if you ping this address, all the routers on your local network would, uh, will answer. That's pretty nice. ICP type 133. And any router on the network will then answer with a router advertisement um, reply. And there will be the network part, the prefix, lifetime, and so on and so on. So this is basic, basically DHCP Lite. You don't have the DNS servers yet, but you can find them with another multicast. So who is the DNS server here? So that's pretty easy. So there is no real need for DHCP anymore. And it doesn't mean, it, it's not important how dumb the machine is. If it's a toaster, if it knows IPv6, IP version 6 can get on the internet. So. But anyone can, anyone can send those router advertisements. And there, I wrote a tool for that. And this tool tries to be a little bit clever because you can set priorities on routers and stuff, and it always claims to be the highest priority. So it will usually become the default router on the network and get, a, get every traffic. So neighbor discovery is 
like in IPv4, ARP request, who has his IP address, who is, has his MAC address. Um, same here, you have a network solicitation request, ICMP type 135. Um, you send it to everyone on your local network who has this IP address. And then the owner of that IP address sends an ICMP type 136, which is um, neighbor advertisement, and says, hey, uh, this is my MAC address. So you might know the tool Parasite, which I wrote five, six years ago about ARP man in the middle on um, tools. This is now Parasite 6, which is the same for, IC, IC, uh, IT, for this attack. Uh, it just claims to have every IP address on the network and tries to be very fast. So sometimes it's, it's fa sometimes it's faster as the kernel, sometimes it's slower. It also depends on the network speed and stuff. So I did it over wireless, and I was still able to get some, to redirect some traffic yesterday on my machine. <laughs> I had to test it, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, works very well. Yes, I come to that later, and why you will never see that. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's in the design spec, yes. Um, um, the question was um, that this can be secured by IPsec, and I said, yes, that's what's in the specs, but we will never see it. But I come to that later, because that's an important point, and that's why it's still, all the vulnerabilities are still in there. But I come to that, don't worry. Um, the duplicate address detection works exactly the same as also a solicitation question says, who has this IP address? Um, and if nobody answers, it just assumes, okay, nobody is using that. Well, I wrote another tool which just says, hey, I have this IP address, I have this IP address, I have this IP address, and well. Windows is very happy about this, not allowing you on the network. <laughs> um, I can tell you, Linux doesn't care. Linux has the worst implementation IP version 6 I've encountered. Every other operating system, including Windows, is better. It, it's just, it's so bad. It's a, really the worst implementation I saw in IP version 6. Stuff is not working. And I made an implementation error. I'll show you that later, because this can be used for nice smurfing. <laughs> but only Linux. All others are fine. Oh, we, oh, we already it's smurfing. Oh. Okay, smurfing. Smurfing. It's a very interesting misuse of broadcast addresses on the internet. Um, you send a packet to a broadcast address, so like a ping request, and you get lots of replies. Because usually, well, most operating systems send a reply to a multicast echo request. Um, so what people were doing, send those requests, but spoofing the source address of your request for someone you didn't like. So he was getting all the replies. And this was very nice to fill up their network connection and DOS them. Um, if you want to smurf an IPv6, it doesn't work because there are no broadcast addresses. And the usual multicast addresses are, are linked local only or site local only. Um, it doesn't really help you. Um, these, there's an RFC which states um, that ICMP response should be sent when a destination was a multicast address. There are some exceptions where a response to a multicast packet is being made. Um, there, is a Cisco, there are two big Cisco security documents which says this is the, these are the vulnerabilities in IP version 6 and we have to handle. And they said, oh, this is not a problem. Yeah? But if you read the spec closely, there are exception mates and they got it wrong. And there are nice ways to exploit that. Locally, you can always smurf, but this isn't real because you're smurfing yourself too. It would only help you if you hack a local machine and then smurf the local network great deal. You can only always DOS your local network, it doesn't matter how. Um, remote depends on implementation on routing headers and fragmentation and stuff. Um, I wrote tool, two tools for that. Um, one is Smurf 6, which just does the local initiated Smurfs, so it just floods the local um, all nodes multicast address, so it's nothing really special. And then I did R smurf because I found a vulnerability in the IP version 6 implementation of Linux. Oh, big surprise. <laughs> so it's reverse smurf because it works, it works differently. You just send a ping request to some, some Linux box. His real destination, so not a multicast, broadcast, whatever, no, to his IP address. However, a source address, you specify the multicast address for all nodes. 
every other operating system says, oh no, I'm not doing that, I'm not dumb. <laughs> yeah. Well, Linux is sometimes different. <laughs> so, so what happens, you can smurf from remote with that very easily. And there's nothing you can, maybe hopefully they will do a kernel patch for that to remove that vulnerability. Um, or it's more of a logic error, not like, oh, it's crashing. So I don't know if we will really see that. Um, so from remote, if you have a system with 100 Linux servers, you send one packet, you can wrote locally 10,000 packets. Oh, this can be very, very cool. Okay, but I'm not, not a big fan of denial of service stuff because that's just lame. Um, so let's get to the routing protocol stuff. Um, in IP versions, well, normally the routing protocols provide their own security mechanism, like MD5 MD authentication on o OSPF, BGP and stuff. Um, this is, does not change in IP version 6 except for OSP version 3. And now we come back to that question about what about IPsec? IPsec is included in IP version 6, so it should solve all your problems. In theory, yes. Um, OSPF, the working group, also thought, hey, IPsec is there, Let's do, they should do authentication and, and encryption. So why caring about that? So if you use OSPF in IP version 6 and you don't have IPsec, there's no security whatsoever. And this will be a problem because OSPF is, in my opinion, the best local area um, routing protocol and lose lots of, in lots of network. But if you change to IP version 6, you should change your routing protocol. So now let me tell something about IPsec. IPsec is part of the protocol, everything's there, so why not using it? The main problem is always encryption is key distribution. How do you, how do you get one key to another person? Um, if you are within a company, this is something maybe you can manage. You can have a certi certificate authority, you can put the keys into DNS, DNSSEC or whatever, and there are the keys. If someone wants to encrypt to someone, he requests um, the key and then encrypts stuff. That's okay. But on the internet, you will never ever see that. Who will be holding the keys? Yeah, Americans would say, yeah, we, we will have the keys, trust us. <laughs> Europeans will say, never, never, ever. Chinese will say, I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the problem. Nobody will trust the others to, that they will handle it nicely. So this will take 20, 30, 50 years, if ever, until we have, could, can, have, can deploy IPsec globally on the world. So this is why we will not see it. We might see it in some companies who are very aware of the problems, but then again, you will see implementation problems. Implementation problems are that, that it will slow down everything. Just to get the keys, to distribute the keys, this will be a big problem. There will be another problem I will show you later when I go to visioning what will be problems in IP version 6 when we use it. So, then you have routing header manipulation, and this is basically source routing in IP version 6. Um, you have a server, and there's a firewall in between. Um, you would like to access, let's say, the admin web port, which is there, but is not allowed by the firewall. No, I, no communication to this IP address is allowed, um, but you may access the other server. So, with source routing, you could say, on IP version 4, please give the packet to that machine, and if it receives it, remove the IP address, put another target in, and pass it on. Um, same is in IP version 6, the routing headers. Exactly the same. And you can do the same here. So what firewalls usually have, or uh, routers also, is they don't allow source routed frames. But there are ways around that with IP version 6. Um, there is in iLive 6, or not slash remote, I also implemented in this, so this is not an extra tool anymore. Um, you can just specify, do routing hackers, routing headers, specify as many IP addresses as you want, um, where it should pass through, and then you can do this attack to do a live scanning. Fragmentation. Fragmentation is very cool. So first, they fixed a big problem IP version 4. You saw this speech of Dan Kaminsky, I think, where he said, or oh, they, it was so bad, why should a router in between do fragmentation? This is fixed. In IP version 6, a router in between does never fragment. If the link, the package should be going over, is too small, you just say, oh no, wrong MTU size, resend please. 
This is how it should be done. So problem solved. Um, still, of course, you can do fragmentation as a source. If you're the system which sends the packets you do can do fragmentation. So we have the same problems like what can we do with reassembling? What if, if packets overlap? We can play the same games. But we can do one more thing. Don't have it, have it in this slide. No, this is not in this slide. Um, I'll come back to that later. Of course, there's something very nice you can do with fragmentation and routing headers. Um, this is something you can experiment here on CCC with I'm showing you now. So watch out. Um, here you have your firewall. You do IP version 4 and try to get a public server, for example, to the Telnet port or whatever, or NetBIOS, and it's protected by the firewall. They say, hey, I don't allow this. Um, what people don't realize, and this is the same for many people configuring their own OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Linux, filter rules, whatsoever, the IP version 6 is a complete different part of the kernel. So just because you have a drop all rule as default, it's not affecting IP version 6. So, if you don't have special filter rules by IP version 6, you bypass these rules. So, if you can connect somehow to a system via IP version 6, good chances that you can get through, can bypass the filter rules. You can try it here. It works. I tried this on some. Most have it because people use something like um, SUSE Firewall, for example, where this is already, if you just use SUSE Firewall, it sets IP version 6 rules, for example. Red Hat does the same as far as I know. But if you do your own rules, you will usually forget this because you don't know. Yeah, and it works. Uh, I tested it uh, here. So, this was basically what are the vulnerabilities in IP version 4 compared to an IP version 6 and how to exploit them. So, this is just one page which should make you one thing clear. Also, IP version 6 should be much easier to implement, but this was one of the design goals. If you see this list, you'll see it's not the case. This is a very small excerpt. If you look on, on Bugtrack ID list on security focus, I found over 50, so I verified them that are really IP version 6 related. 50 IP version 6 vulnerabilities so far. And not everything is IP version 6 enabled already. There are so much things you can do wrong, even if the protocol is easy. And if you take a look what kind, what kind of bugs these, e these are, you will see, hey, I've seen it before. There's one important lesson people don't learn. Learn that. <laughs> so, research and implementation tests. Um, I did limited implementation tests because I had not that much time, because I did a presentation originally for Japan. Um, so I was tested what's the Linux 6 kernel, Windows XP Service Pack 2, Cisco iOS 12, and FreeBSD 5.3, and see for some stuff I said, how does the system would react to this? Um, by the way, you can also, also look for um, denial of service stuff, like if I put this option header in this way, can it, can it crash? I didn't look for that stuff because a fix and it's gone, um, but there are stuff also in OpenBSD, I can assure you. Um, it's not the point here. Um, responding to packets to multicast destinations. So this is something you usually can turn off by an option, so I don't want to answer that. By, de by default, Linux and FreeBSD have them open. So if you send a multicast ping request, you get an answer from these two systems. That's not really a security problem. Um, it makes things easier, that's basically it. But I just wanted to see what are the defaults for the, two, for the systems. Um, the responding to packets with a multicast destination, same as here, but not doing an echo request, but putting in an invalid header option. So it can be ICMP, TCP, UDP, doesn't need to have any um, upper layer protocol in there, doesn't matter. If you just put an invalid header option there, they all respond to. And you can't really um, configure that off. So, by this way, you can find all local systems, always. Um, responding to packets from multicast stress, this was the remorse, remote smurf I was talking about. Only Linux does that. Only they are dumb enough. Routing header to multicast, this was a very interesting idea. Why well, I thought, hey, we don't have broadcast addresses. I still would like to <laughs> trigger the remote multicast address. So what I can do, I spe specify a routing header, so I get to the target network, and then say forward this frame please to the local multicast address all nodes. Yeah. Sadly, they all didn't want that. 
Otherwise, it would have been very, very cool for remote scanning. But sadly, it uh, didn't work. But I found another thing which is cool. Fragmentation and following routing header. This can be used to bypass firewalls and routers and whatever. Um, in, if you have a Cisco, if you have Solaris, if you have Linux, doesn't matter, and use them as a router, you can say, don't forward source routed frames. And then any packet which has a source routed option is just thrown away. Yeah. You can do this with IP version 6.2, but if you put fragmentation before that, and you can even do one shot fragmentation. One shot fragmentation means you specify this is um, the first fragmentation, so starting at zero, and set the flag this is the last fragment. It doesn't really make sense, but they all, they all eat that. And afterwards, you put the forwarding routing header. All in between says, oh, no, there's no forwarding header. I'll pass it along. That's fine. It's fine until the target system. Target system does a defragmentation. Hey, there's a routing header. Let's honor it. And it uses it. And all are vulnerable to this, even Cisco and stuff. And that's pretty cool. So if, there's, if there is security on your ISP, you can always, we will always be able to bypass that and use routing headers. That's pretty cool. Because source routing, you know ISPs where source routing still works. I don't know one, there will be very few, but on the internet it will not work. In the future it will work again. That's cool. So that was the one shot fragmentation, all are vulnerable to this. So I only did very limited research and because on very limited time frame, because I have another project which I'll show you afterwards. Um, so what, we, what will we future research from THC on that? Global multicast exploitation, which is FF, Zero E, this is global multicast stuff, like what are all the NTP servers on the internet? I will do some more research on that because this will be more, much fun. MLD, which is a multi-listener discovery protocol version 3. Um, it's not a very security sensitive topic, but it seems there is some interesting stuff you can do with that. And IP version 4, IP version 6. There are different ways on how to migrate from one to the other. And there are vulnerabilities in there. Some have been found already in the protocol specs. Oh, you can do this and that. Um, but there will be more. The problem is there was not much research time spent to this already in, this, in the security community. So there will be more. And we will uh, also put some time on that. OK, so um, upcoming. So this is more the vision stuff. So what will be the future? There will be more. There will be specialized attack tools for IPv6. But the basic note is it will not be much different than what we already have in IPv4. So there are not more vulnerabilities or more threats we have to work against. Worms will be much of a different in IPv6. TCP IP worms like Slammer, infecting everything within 20 minutes, the whole internet, will not work because of the large IP address space. So this, they can't use that simple technique. So they will do the other stuff. Email worms will stay because this doesn't change. Messenger P2P worms will come because it's easier to spread. Why this means um, these worms will more use like public DNS information, trying local search engine stuff. So these will change, but they will be, become much rarer. And DNS servers become the primary target because that's where all the information you're interested in will be in. Attacks will move more to clients where you attack one local system and then you attack the rest of the network from there. So not like usual, oh, let's scan the whole range. Oh, there's, there's, and there's a vulnerable service. Oh, I'm in, in all three systems. This will not be the case. We'll have trouble finding one server, and this will use the web server, DNS server, something which is public. Attack this, trying to compromise, and if you achieve it, then you go local. So this will be the, the future um, penetration test methodology. Um, when IPsec is widely deployed, if, so within a company or worldwide, which will be 20 years in the future, certificates will be a primary security concern because this will be impersonation. Yeah? So if you attack a system, if you compromise them, the first thing you will do, you will try to steal the certificate to be allowed on the network. So this will be important then. Okay, so. Conclusion, so far no new risk in IPv6, some improvement against IPv4. It will have a strong impact on the hackers and also on the administrators on how they have to administrate their network. Um, if you have IPsec, it will not IPv6 really secure. 
It will make tech tracing easier. It will sniffing man in the middle, very difficult. But web application will still be vulnerable. This will not have no impact at all on that. Um, lots of, if you take a look at IP version 6, first it looks very easy. But the more you read about it, the more you research about it, it gets so complicated. That's why it's not much research from people there, because it's just so much. Even for the new hackers who will come in the future, who don't know IP version 4, trying to, ask, to understand IP version 6 in the first place will be very tough. So if you start, oh, this is IP version 6, I try to learn it, I'm new. This will be, this is, this is hard stuff. So very short questions, and then I do a 10 minute presentation on the other new project. Questions? Yes? Right, so uh, from your point of view, seeing all the vulnerabilities and all the issues we have there, uh, what are your three key recommendations you would have to actually secure a network apart from turning it off, obviously? Uh, and IPsec was obviously one if you do it within a closed network. But apart from that, uh, what would you recommend to do if you want to secure your network and use IP6, version 6? Well, for security, if you move from IP4 to IP, IP version 6, you gain a little bit more security. So it's better to move to IP version 6 and stay in IP version 4 for security. Um, well, what you can do to enhance, well, do the, the IP6 configuration on local machine secure, so turn off this, turn off that option and stuff. Um, enable IP ver IPsec, um, configure your filter list correctly, and do host good, good host security, and protect your DNS servers. That's basically it. This usual stuff, this does not change. I mean, that's, that's the main topic. It just fixed minor stuff, put some new, little new stuff in, but this has not, no really a security implication. So other question? Um, this should have, so the question was for those who did not understand it, what about mobile IP version 6? Did we also look at that? Um, this should have been on the research stuff because there are different techniques on how to update on um, mobile IP version 6. So I'm now in this location, please send the packet here. Now I'm that location, please do that here. So um, they, there are different solutions to this with routing headers and stuff. Um, but no, we haven't looked into that yet, but we'll do in the future because it will be very interesting. Yes, another question? Are you aware of any packet filter that's able to strip off source routing options? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing about that. Well, you can implement it in, the, in a stateful fi firewall, of course, but normally a firewall just throw the packet away or leave it through and it's not reconstructing. Yeah, but you have to step through all the, the Yes. Page. Which should be easy, but you can still get that wrong, as we saw in some of the vulnerabilities. Okay, if there are more questions, um, just drop by afterwards. So, um, we've got 10 minutes left for the second um, presentation, which was, oh, for, oh, sorry, sorry, um, I have to skip back. I'm not very happy with the current code state. Um, as I told you, I would like to shoot the um, implement implement guys on, on the kernel on how they do some stuff. It's really horrible. So it's not on the usual public release stuff like chc.org. It's kind of hidden. I hope to have it in more, pro so the code works, yeah? but there are some limitations. And I try to get rid of them, but until then I it will not officially release it on the website and say, hey, it's a cool tool because of the, we, ha we have some quality, we like to have some quality in our tools. And this is not meeting our normal standards. It does its start job, but could be more effective. So that's why it's somehow hidden here. Note that down if you want to have it. Okay, I'll leave it here for a minute and just, and just tell you what the next um, pre small presentation is about. Um, who of you know war dialing? Hands up, please. War dialing? Well, yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's a hacker conference, of course. And who of you know THC scan or use THC scan? Uh, uh, some of them? Okay, war dialing is not that much used anymore, for I have no understanding. It's much more fun and much easier to hack than doing TCP stuff, because no one looks for their modems. So, THC scan is very old now. We had our 10th birthday in October, so I did an update to the version to have some, well, presents for the public. Um, but still, we are in the internet age. 
So things have to change. Wall dining is still interesting, so how could we do that more efficient? And so the idea of THC scan next generation was born. It's completely different. It's not like, oh, you just upgrade to this and everything is fine. It's something completely different. It's a complement. So THC scan was a war dialer for MS-DOS. Um, you can even use it today with a PC emulator. works perfect. So uh, what was it? Two years ago, Plasmid, um, one of our members, we, we, sometimes we make internal challenges. So can you make that? And he was able to run it on his Mac OS um, via the infrared port on his mobile phone to dial 0800 numbers. So it can still do that. It still works. It cannot be ported or updated or anything. It's true, Pascal. Ten years ago, that was the main language to use. Yeah, not today anymore. So the coding idea was a water for Linux and Windows, so this is not important. Of course, that's the standard today. But support as many modems as you can find. So having 10,000 of modems connected to one war dialing um, system, do distributed scanning, do detached scanning, so you connect somewhere and say, hey, please scan this range, then you log off. Going there some days later, oh, give me all the results. Have GUI command line, have database support, have voice over IP support. Carry identification, carry hacking, and scanning large ranges of numbers. So I, what I want to get to that I can scan completely 0800 in just one command. So this, this is my goal. But it takes lots of CPU, power, RAM resources, and hard disk space. So this is kind of a challenge. The, the basic concept is like this. You have your client um, who connects to the master. The master is the brain, controls everything. It co Every modem you want to do war dialing will have its own zombie controlling that modem. Just one zombie for one modem. And you tell the master, please connect to this zombie and also use that in war dialing. And the idea is that you can transparently say, hey, at this modem, at this morning, in the middle of scanning, remove modems while scanning, it doesn't matter, it works perfectly, no problem. And all of in the future have a THC scan like local GUI which directly connects to a zombie. But that's very, really optional. So the basic concept is client, a master, and a zombie. So today, we have it working. Just only the command line tool, no GUI yet, let, uh, yet but the GUI is really not really needed. Um, commands is, are simple. You can just use Telnet to control everything, like connect, which connects just your system to a master. With add and delete commands, you add or delete modems or zombies. With this command, you just start scanning a whole range. You can cancel them, can get more output. You can dump the replies, you can see what's going on. You can see all the, mo all the replies of all zombies if you want to. You can see oh, how fast is, this, is the status of that scan? Has it already started? Um, how many numbers are already dialed and stuff? I, want, I wanted to show it live, but with Windows, it's much harder to, to set things up. Um, the server. Listens for clients, you can connect with as much as 100 clients, doesn't matter. Um, does all the connection pool for all the zombies, for all the modems. Splits the scan ranges to the zombies in chunks, so every zombie gets some numbers. And before the, before the numbers are depleted, it sends more numbers, so there's never a lag of, oh, I need something to scan, I don't have anything anymore. So time is efficiently used. Keeps control of which number has been scanned. Busy numbers are redialed up to a number you can define, like say, if the number is three times busy, don't dial it anymore and they are not redialed immediately, but later, so it's done intelligently. It saves data in reports. Um, important thing is, only this master knows about the scan results. <coughs> Clients don't, well, they can lock their stuff, but they have no intelligence. Everything is done in the master. The zombie is pretty dumb. It can just operate the modem and talk to the master. That's it. This keeps things very, very easy and very portable. And verify to work is um, for, for all three components, um, Linux, Windows, Sukmin, it works perfectly, and Mac OS X, works fine. So, upcoming versions. So, the basic functionality as you see it is done. It's still proof of concept, it works, but it is more of an alpha or beta release. Stage two will be that it has SSL encryption and challenge response authentication. We'll have carrier identification, remote modem configuration, and some other missing features like, hey, scan these um, numbers in a text file. Blacklisting, prefix restriction, blah. Stage three, which will which is scheduled for pH neutral in 2000 next year, 
automated login hacking, SQL database support, and now it gets interesting. Stage four is planned to have voice over IP support, which means you just, you have a tool where you have the information, so this is my SIP gateway, just give that information in dials, just without a modem, just with TCP IP to a SIP gateway. You, you get a WAF file in reply, which is do do do, busy signals, whatever, or modem carrier, and then we do some FFT stuff to identify if there's a carrier or not. So, war dialing without a modem. This will be cool, and hopefully a GUI. I'm looking for someone who would like to do that, because I'm not a GUI guy. So, whoever would like to do that and join the project, it's open for everyone, especially for the GUI. And stage five. Stage five will be very special. Um, stage five, will I, will I will release next year, is a community master server. So, anyone can join that master server. So, can get an account from us, can add their own modem, and then by that we can have large number of modems available. Lots of stuff in here, so it's very, very complex. So what basically happens, if your modem is used as in a war dialing, and you can say just dial 0800 numbers with my, with my zombie here, not, nothing else, so it, no cost for you, you get credits. So once you have acquired enough credits, you can start your own war dial. So let's use all the network to scan these numbers. If the, if the result should be placed in the public database, anybody can see that these results, and it costs less credits. If it's just for you, nobody sh else should see the results, it costs you more. Yeah? So this is a basic concept. So you can have lots of modems connected together, um, have good authentication on that, have a public database, have lots of fun. Yeah, so that will be the community project. Um, will there be security in there? Of course. In the next version, SSL, challenge response, authentication, um, blah, stuff, of course. Questions? Um, if not, THC.org, it will be downloaded on the 1st of January. You can already um, download it from the project page, which is www.thc.org slash THC dash TSNG for THC scan next generation. THC dash TSNG. Well, that's basically it. I made it in time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>